everyone. Today, we've been honored by the presence of one of the greatest minds of our times and a pioneer in his own field, Professor Eric Stark Maskin. Professor Maskin is a Nobel laureate and currently holds the position of the Albert O. Hirschman Professor of Social Sciences at the Institute for Advanced Study, as well as that of visiting lecturer with the rank of Professor at Princeton University's prestigious Economics Department. A very good morning to you too, sir. For those of us aspiring to be high academic achievers, Professor Maskin proves to be an apt example of representing a model academic career that some of us can only hope to achieve. Having received his bachelor's in mathematics and PhD in applied mathematics from Harvard University, Dr. Maskin went to the University of Cambridge, where he received an honorary MA while being a research fellow at Jesus College. His professional endeavors are consistent with his reputable intellectual standing, having taught in prominent institutions such as MIT and Harvard before moving to Princeton. As we immerse ourselves in today's dialogue with the hopes of addressing the question as to why global markets have failed to address inequality, we will come to realize that there could be no better individual to divulge the knowledge behind this theme than Professor Maskin, with his abundant and incomparable experience in the field of economics. His particularly well-known work on mechanism design theory earned him the Nobel Prize in 2007 along with two of his colleagues. Professor Maskin's groundbreaking research in this area aims to introduce mechanisms to the market that would lead to optimal outcomes for all participants. With applications in the financial sector, development sector, business management, and studies of voter behavior, Dr. Maskin's work opens up endless possibilities for global economies. It's a privilege to have with us such an innovative and revolutionary thinker, and it's our responsibility to make the best of that opportunity. So without further ado, I would like to welcome onto stage Professor Eric Stark Maskin. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at the International School of Phnom Penh. Uh, I think I will plan to talk for a few minutes, but I'm particularly interested to hear what you have to say. So after uh, a brief introduction to the topic of uh, inequality and globalization, which is one of my recent research projects, I'd like to open the floor to, to questions. And I'm very eager to hear uh, what's on your mind. Let me um, begin by saying a few words about uh, how I got into uh, economics in the first place. Uh, in a few years, uh, you'll be going to, most of you will be going to university, and you will start uh, thinking about what you might want to do for a career. Uh, and let, let me explain uh, how the process worked in, in my case. Uh, I, frankly, didn't really know anything about economics when I was your age. Or I, I knew of the subject, I, I knew the subject existed, but I didn't really have any idea what it consisted of. And when I went to university, it was actually with the intention of perhaps becoming a mathematician. Uh, I, uh, I studied mathematics as an undergraduate, and loved the subject very much. I uh, thought I would probably continue. Uh, at this point, I think the microphone is <laughs> Shall I continue without the microphone? Can you hear me in back? Yeah. yeah. OK. So, so I imagine that I would continue uh, in, in mathematics, but Almost by accident. Okay. Almost by accident, I wandered into an economics class, taught, as it turned out, although I didn't know it at the time, by one of the great economists of the 20th century, Kenneth Arrow, who happened to be uh, at Harvard, where I was an undergraduate at that time. 
And I was mesmerized by his class. Uh, frankly, he wasn't the greatest lecturer in the world, uh, but it didn't really matter because he had such enthusiasm for the subject that he was able to convey so well uh, what economics was all about that I, that I was converted. So let, let me explain what it was that, that I liked about the subject. Coming from mathematics, I appreciated uh, subjects which were, which were rigorous. That is, where you could state in unambiguous terms what your claim is, what your hypothesis is, and where there were unambiguous ways of testing that hypothesis. So I, I particularly appreciated mathematical and scientific subjects. And it turned out that economics offered all of that. Economics is a scientific subject. But uh, I also learned that economics has the potential to transform society. That is, beyond being a interesting intellectual enterprise, it is also uh, potentially enormously important for society. Uh, economic ideas, uh, as the economist John Maynard Keynes once, once said, for better or for worse, uh, determine almost everything in, in public life. So I, I learned that from, from uh, taking Kenneth Arrow's class. And as a result of that uh, experience, I decided to change directions and pursue economics. And I've been doing it ever since. Uh, no regrets about it at all. Uh, and I mentioned a moment ago that, that one of the attractions of economics to me was that it had the potential to grapple with and perhaps solve large uh, economic and, and social questions. Uh, one such question is what to do about inequality, income inequality. Uh, income inequality is problematic for a number of reasons. First, uh, it offends our egalitarian impulses. We, uh, we, we believe that uh, all people are inherently equal, and therefore, to the extent that they're treated very differently, uh, is morally repulsive. Also, particularly in developing countries like Cambodia, when we talk about inequality, we, and we talk particularly about the people at the bottom of the income scale, we're talking about some of the very poorest people in the world. And so to do something about inequality is also doing something about lifting people out of poverty. Uh, and then a third reason for worrying about inequality is because it's uh, disruptive to political and social stability. It, it tears at the social fabric. A society cannot survive indefinitely when, when there are vast gaps between rich and poor. So for all of those reasons, I was attracted to the problem of how to deal with, with inequality. And the way that I came at uh, this problem was uh, through its connection with globalization. By globalization, I mean the phenomenon of uh, <coughs> it, the internationalization 
of trade. And so, so we had an, a, a very important uh, period of globalization in the last 20 to 25 years. This has entailed an enormous increase in trade across countries, in international trade. It's also entailed an enormous increase in the internationalization of production. So uh, it's, it's now commonplace for many goods to have their component pieces produced in very different parts of the world. Take uh, the uh, prototypical modern good the computer. Uh, the age we live in might be symbolized uh, by computers. Well, computers uh, are a very good example of uh, internationally produced products. They're often designed in one country, maybe the United States. They'll be programmed someplace else, perhaps in Europe, and they will be assembled, put together, uh, in still a third place, and, and today that's very often China. Uh, so globalization has given rise to a tremendous increase in the internationalization of production. What does all this have to do with inequality? Well, when the supporters, the proponents of globalization uh, were arguing in favor of getting rid of tariffs, creating free trade areas, such as the, the, the new China ASEAN free trade area, one of the arguments they put forward in favor of globalization was the idea that it would reduce inequality within developing countries, that is, reduce the gap between rich and poor in developing countries. Unfortunately, just the opposite happened. So in, in many developing countries around the world, and, and Cambodia is a prime example of this, there has been great economic progress due to globalization. Cambodia, for example, has a thriving garment industry, which was made possible by the fact that uh, it's able to export uh, garments to Europe and the United States. So that's been terrific from Cambodia's standpoint. But at the same time, this economic success has tended to increase the divergence between the haves and the have-nots. That is, it is, it is people with, who have at least some education and at least some skills who get the jobs associated with global markets. And those who don't have skills and who don't have education are left out of the picture altogether. That's what my study that's what my study of globalization uh, indicated. And once the problem was diagnosed, I was interested in understanding uh, what might be done about it. Well, if... Uh, we'll try one more. <laughs> Okay, if this, if, if this doesn't work, I'm just going to speak without a mic, which this is not such a big room that that would be a big problem. Uh, so I, I, I was very interested in diagnosing, in, in, after diagnosing, often trying to find a remedy, trying to find a prescription. Uh, the obvious prescription, if, if people are being left behind by not having enough education and training is to give them that training. 
The problem is that such training is expensive. That is, it doesn't, it doesn't come for free. And the question is, who is going to pay for the training and, and education? Well, the, 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 the people concerned cannot themselves pay for the education. After all, we are talking about very poor people. Uh, and we're talking about giving them some training and education so that they, that they finally move out of poverty. But before they move out of poverty, there's no way that they're going to be able to pay for the education. Uh, so they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be able to, to pay for it. Uh, we can't expect private industry uh, to do the job, or at least to do the job fully, either. Uh, and, uh, and here's the reason why. Uh, of course, many companies do train or do offer some training for workers they hire. The problem is that they are not likely to provide enough such training. Uh, if, if you're a company and you hire me uh, to work for you and you give me some training so that I can do uh, the, the task at hand, you're going to have to pay me more because I'm now a higher skilled worker. And so, some of your investments in my, in my skills will already be lost to you by virtue of your having to pay me a higher wage. Furthermore, I can always leave your company after I've received the training. Number, number four. <laughs> I can always leave your company uh, after receiving the training, go to work for your competitor, in which case your investment will be lost altogether. That all suggests that we cannot rely on private industry to provide the training and education needed to overcome the inequality problem. Well, who's left? One important uh, actor in this story, one, one important uh, institution we would expect or we would hope would come to the rescue. Uh, and now I'm going now I'm going to abandon the microphone because it, it seems to be cutting out again. One important possible solution is government. Uh, government can fund schools, government can fund job training programs. But in poor countries, governments themselves are often strapped for money to finance such projects. And so uh, another important source of funds is from overseas in the, in, in the form of foreign aid, in the form of loans, in the form of direct investments. Uh, the, the major lesson I want to convey, though, is out of the many things that governments and uh, foreign aid entities could invest in, there is no higher priority than job training and education. It, it's the people of the society that make that society rich or poor. It's an investment in their human capital which determines the future success or failure of that society. And it's an investment in the poorest people of, of the society which uh, is the most effective way of 
trying to deal with the difficult problem of inequality. So thank you very much for listening, and let's open it up. It can always be thrown out by the people and replaced by someone else. So democratic institutions are one way of keeping governments on their toes, preventing them from indulging in the corruption, which might be very good for them, but which is bad for the society at large. So that's one idea. And another idea from economics is the idea that government officials are less likely to succumb to corruption if their jobs as officials are made attractive. And one way of making them attractive is to pay them a comfortable salary. This, by the way, is a solution that Singapore has. You may be aware of the fact that Singapore has one of the least corrupt governments in the world. One reason for that, there's no single answer, but one important reason for that is that in Singapore, government people are paid exceedingly well, and so the risk of losing their position through a corruption scandal keeps them in line. I don't pretend that these two ideas are going to solve the problem of corruption, but they can help. Relating to inequality, do you think the rich should pay more taxes than the poor? That's a very good question. Do I think the rich should pay more taxes than the poor? Well, that's actually a moral question. Now you may want another question, but it's one that I'm happy to answer. In fact, I do. I do think the rich should pay more. In fact, I would go farther than this. I would say that the rich should pay a higher proportion of their income in taxes than the poor should. In other words, I would argue that for a just society, taxes should be progressive, and richer people should pay at a higher rate. And the reason I would make this argument, but I have to say that it's not an economic argument, it's a moral argument, is that it is the idea that society benefits us all. The rich of the society could not be rich, could not prosper, were they not in a place where their talents and skills could be rewarded, where their safety could be protected, where they had the opportunity of exchange with other people. And for all of these great benefits that they are receiving from society, they owe, I would argue, a debt back to that society. One obvious way of repaying that debt is through higher taxes. Professor, you mentioned that free trade is not being successful in reducing disparities of income within countries, but do you think it can be effective in reducing disparities amongst different countries? Very, very good question. So, I was talking about inequality within countries, but of course we're also interested in the question, what happens across countries? That is, are the poor countries of the world catching up to the rich countries as a result of globalization? And there, actually, I'm happy to say that the answer is a qualified yes. That is, 
if, 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 if you look at the uh, relative positions of Developing countries 25 years ago, <coughs> compared with their with their rich neighbors, there has been some catch up. Not as much as we would have liked, but at least uh, things are moving in the right direction across countries. Even if even if uh, they haven't been moving in the right direction within. Within countries, how is globalization supposed to promote equality, and how can that be promoted? Okay, uh, good question. So, uh, the proponents of globalization were relying on a theory called the theory of comparative advantage to make the case that globalization <coughs> is going to do something. the comparative advantage argument goes. Uh, uh, imagine that you are a developing country like, like Cambodia. Uh, one reason why uh, Cambodia is not rich is because if you look at their workforce, it's heavily weighted toward people with low skills. So, so the proportion of people with low skills is much higher here than it would be in a rich country. Uh, so, so what happens as a result of globalization? Well, uh, globalization allows a country like Cambodia to concentrate on producing goods for which its uh, workforce is well suited. Cambodia doesn't have to produce uh, all goods. It can, it can concentrate on the goods which require only a low skill input and import the others. That, that's what globalization allows you to do. It allows you to import the goods you don't produce yourself. Well, if developing countries are shifting, thanks to globalization, to goods which require a low-skill input, that is going to raise the demand for people with low skills. And if they are shifting away from goods that require a high-skill input, that is going to lower the demand for high skill labor and therefore reduce the wage that is paid for high skill labor. So low skill wages go up as a result of globalization, high skill wages come down as a result of globalization, and inequality is reduced. That is the classic <coughs> argument which globalization proponents made. It, it, by the way, it's a very respectable argument. It, it's, it's an argument which actually was correct for about 200 years. So it was first put forward by British economist David Ricardo in the early 19th century. And for all previous vocalizations, it, it, uh, it worked quite a charm. It, it, it did accurately predict what happened to production and to wages as a result of globalization. But this globalization was different. And the reason, the main reason why it was different was because of the internationalization of production, which the theory of comparative advantage leaves out. And so my own book, uh, my own recent work has, has been directed for uh, expanding the theory of comparative advantage
Absolutely. I, I, I am not by any means against localization. Quite the contrary. I, I, I do think that localization is key to uh, economic progress, to economic development in poor countries. Uh, the, the point I'm trying to make this morning is, however, that globalization is not uh, a monolithic thing, good thing. Uh, that is, its, it's benefits, and, and it has very powerful benefits, do not accrue equally to everybody. And in fact, they accrue mainly to people at the top leaving out the people at the bottom. So I would never argue that we should make this organization. What I would argue is that we should take steps through education, through job training, to ensure that the benefits are more equal. I'm afraid, I'm afraid that, uh, that, that, that that is a risk, and, and uh, one of the one of the things that has held back many African countries, not all, but, but uh, a good many, and, and I'm afraid that, that African countries are an example. Uh, Africa is probably the continent in the world which has been which is least benefit from globalization. One, one reason I'm afraid that it has not been able to benefit more is precisely because corruption is so uh, there are sadly there is no such answer to but uh, clearly uh, you have to do something about it before you can seriously.
in principle, foreign investment should be beneficial to a foreign country because, after all, uh, that investment, the, the investing company <coughs> is pumping some money in, in, into, uh, into the local economy, into the economy as a whole, uh, even in your uh, Chinese. Uh, <coughs> China was presumably paying Iraq with, with uh, right to, to develop these oil wells. And so Iraq was getting something out of the deal. Now, uh, I, I think your, your question is, is pointing not so much to the, uh, uh, to the question of whether foreign investment can be beneficial, but how to get more benefits for the developing country from that investment. As yeah, I, I see it, the developing country has resources like any country has resources that have uh, a market that is properly exploited to uh, help a lot. And if you know, the state is properly exploited to help a lot, but the foreign, foreign companies are exploited. They are giving something to the economy through, but not as much as they can get it. So the local economy were able to Sure. Well, there, there, there's a trade-off. That, that is, you can keep foreign investors out, in which case you have to do all of the development yourself, but the developing countries don't get to have the wherewithal to do it themselves. Or you can allow foreign investors in. That inevitably means that you're going to be sharing them. The foreign investors uh, are going to have to take something, otherwise they, they wouldn't be getting anything out of the deal either. So, uh, so, so the, the price you pay for having foreign investors come in is that the foreign investors get something too. But that doesn't mean that the deal can't be structured in such a way that, they, that the home country uh, doesn't get something out of it as well. And, 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 and you said that one problem uh, in, the, in the Chinese Iraq example was that uh, local Iraqis weren't being hired uh, because they didn't speak English. But this gets back to the point that I was making uh, in my opening remarks, which is that one problem with globalization, and foreign investment is a very good example of um, Globalization. One problem with globalization is it tends to benefit <coughs> people who have adequate skills. Speaking English is clearly an important international skill. One way of getting more benefit to local people is to give them, it, 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 is to make an investment in their, in their skill set. If I think that, is, in the long run, is a more effective way of trying to get more out of foreign investment rather than taking steps such as banning foreign investment altogether. Um, do you feel that um, African nations will be able to lift themselves from poverty having not been colonizers? That's, that's a, a, a very good question, but a, a very difficult uh, we have the, the countries of the world have already put something like a trillion dollars into Africa, African development. Where I'm sorry to say, rather than the show for it, uh, and we don't yet know uh, how to solve. Of course, one problem is, is corruption, government corruption, uh, but of course, it's not the only uh, Af Africa also uh, has problems associated with climate, uh, uh, tropical diseases. The d disease in Africa is uh, a major impact to uh, to economic progress. Uh, and people there 
suffer from diseases which are practically unknown uh, within the family. And ironically, diseases which are actually very easily treated by cheap, cheap drugs, but they don't, but these countries don't have the, the, uh, the money to pay for these drugs. So, so uh, in addition to trying to do something about corruption, which I suggest is difficult, uh, one important investment for the short to medium term is uh, to try to do something about disease. Uh, I, was, I was actually recently involved myself in a program uh, that the World Bank uh, started to try to encourage private drug companies to develop uh, drugs against pneumococcal diseases. Pneum pneumococcal diseases are, are diseases, uh, bacterial diseases of, of the lungs, which kill literally millions of people in, in Africa today. Uh, and uh, although vaccines against these diseases <coughs> don't yet exist, uh, it's known, enough is known about the, uh, the bacteria which cause these diseases. So it, it's felt that uh, with a few years' development, such vaccines uh, will exist. The problem is that, uh, that private drug companies on their own don't have the incentive to develop vaccines because uh, they want to develop drugs for which there will, there will be a well-paying market. Uh, African countries can't afford to pay very much. And so the World Bank decided uh, to uh, see what it could do about getting some of the rich countries of the world uh, to put some money in a uh, in a fund which would go to supplement what private drug, drug companies would get from from African countries for the development of, uh, of this vaccine. So, so the, the donor money would be added uh, to, the, uh, to the drug company's revenue. And the hope is that this will uh, give them the incentive to develop the vaccine program was just launched, and so I can't say yet whether it will be successful, but I think it's that kind of thing, uh, getting rid of uh, easily uh, treatable diseases, and some not so treatable, not so treatable in my, my area, uh, which would be an important step toward solving that problem. Uh, do I advocate protectionism at least uh, third world country? Do I advocate protectionism? Uh, I don't advocate protectionism, no. Uh, I, I, because I, I think a more effective way of dealing with the, uh, with the ill effect the unpleasant effects of globalization is to invest in things like education rather than trying to stop globalization by uh, itself, which, which protection, protectionism is a way of trying to stop globalization. So I don't, I don't favor, as a rule, I don't favor uh, protectionism. Sometimes, as a transitionary measure, protectionism is necessary. That is, it, it, it takes time for a country to adjust to new circumstances, and it's usually easier for that adjustment if, if the adjustment period is gradual rather than all at once. So to take an example, there is uh, a new free trade area here in 
Southeast Asia, the, 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 the China ASEAN free trade, and it was just launched uh, at the beginning of this month. And this will have the effect of eliminating about 90% of the tariffs which used to exist between the members of ASEAN and China. Uh, well, Cambodia won't actually have its tariffs eliminated until 2015. The, the, the people who structured uh, this agreement recognized that a country like Cambodia could not go immediately from high tariffs to low tariffs without too much disruption <coughs> to, uh, to local industry. So uh, Cambodia and uh, Laos and uh, Myanmar and, and, and several other countries will see the tariff reduction not come to full effect for five years. So there will be some temporary protectionism, but only temporary. Um, currently, the United States is trillions of dollars in debt. Do you think there's any possibility in the future for them to overcome this debt? And secondly, do you think the current monetary policies being pursued by the nation will bring it back to the status of an economic superpower again? Uh, okay, so, so what's going to happen to the United States? Uh, you're quite right that the, the, the uh, national debt of the U.S. is pretty big. And importantly, some of that debt is owed to foreign countries, notably China. Uh, obviously, no country, the United States included, can go on uh, increasing its debt without limits. There, there, there comes a point where, where things have to stop uh, because as the debt goes up, so the debt payments go up. And you know, if the debt gets high enough, you're spending most of your government revenue on paying interest on, on this debt that you see, At some point, you have to stop. Uh, in fact, though, although, although the US debt is looks staggeringly high, it's, it's much, much bigger than, uh, than uh, GMP is so almost all countries in the world. Uh, it's actually not, as a proportion of, of American GMP, it's, it's not yet anywhere near uh, its highest historical level. For example, at the end of World War II, uh, American debt as a, as a fraction of American GDP where it was considerably higher. And so I don't think that we have reached a danger point yet. Um, clearly, though, uh, something is going to ha have to be done in the long run. Now, now, what might that be? At, at the moment, the U.S. is still working its way out of a recession. A serious recession uh, caused uh, economic activity in the U.S. and to, to fall uh, quite dramatically uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, one way of fighting that economic downturn, one of very effective way of fighting that economic downturn, is through spending, government spending. And so actually, as a result of the downturn, the U.S. debt has got uh, uh, even higher. Uh, however, that, that should be regarded as a good thing. That is, that is uh, it is perfectly appropriate. In fact, it is uh, indicated by economic theory. Uh, to 
go into debt to, to, uh, to spend more than your current revenue at times uh, of economic recession. That is the way to fight a recession. As long as when times return to normal and the, and the economy recovers, you go back to trying to bring the debt down. It, it's the second part of that story, bringing the debt down in good times, which I'm afraid that uh, the American government ignored for a long period of time. It, during the, uh, the, the decade that just ended, the U.S. was largely not in recession, for, for, for the, uh, except for the end of the the U.S. was not in recession, and yet it, content, it continued to build its debt up and up and up. That, I think, was a mistake. I hope that that lesson has been learned, and that once the economy gets back to normal, which, which it will, uh, we return to what economists call a counter policy, that is, uh, uh, going into debt, <coughs> Uh, at, at downturns of the business cycle, but bringing the debt down again uh, at the upturns of the cycle. I think following that policy will keep the U.S. strong. It's still the strongest economy in the world. I expect it to be the strongest economy in the world for, for many years to come. But of course, much will depend on whether it pursues sensible uh, budgetary policies. Um, do you think that globalization will help to overcome racial prejudice, or rather, would racial prejudice, you know, prevent globalization? Will globalization overcome racial prejudice? Well. thing is, pursue your own education. Uh, I, I said, I, I was suggesting that, uh, that education is, is the key to development and also the key to reducing inequality. Uh, so so uh, you, you should certainly, you, you certainly need to play your own personal role by, uh, by educating yourself. Uh, but uh, as citizens, as as voters, uh, try 
trying to put pressure through your vote on political candidates, potential political officials, to make education and job training a priority. Also, that, of course, is going to be looking to the medium to the long term. What can we do in the short term? We can't provide more education overnight. But what we can do overnight, practically overnight, is to provide a social safety net for the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable people in society. That is, to provide them with emergency health care, emergency housing, emergency food if they need to lose their ability to get food on their own. So you, as a citizen, of course, can contribute to the social safety net directly by donating money to a organization. It was just a terrible earthquake, actually, a couple of earthquakes in Haiti. And international aid agencies relied on private donations primarily to try to come to the rescue. But also, again, as voters, you can put pressure on your governments to help provide those social safety nets as well. Thank you, Professor, for that very invigorating session. On behalf of the ISPP community, I'd like to present you with a token of our appreciation. It was a pleasure having you here. Thank you for the great questions.